I was actually one of the guys that was saved by the atomic bomb. What, what made you take that decision to, to enlist at 16 years? Patriotism. I mean, this is the worst situation our country has ever had. During the war, it was bad because we had to go over and fight somebody else. But now we're in the middle of our own that they were inventing during the beginning of the war. This was in 43. The small little uh, scope that I had on my plane this one day, number two caught fire at the point of no return. Fire starts coming out of the engine. What do you know about Antarctica? Or is there something where like no one can talk about that stuff? Well, you've got all kinds of people in the Navy, just like... Is there any lesson that you would like to leave for the upcoming generation? Another episode of El Garage Cast. How are you doing, Copa Marcos? Well, right here, right here. Another day. Another, another day, day in the office, like like we like we say. Huh? Today's a special special day, special podcast. Yes. Special we have podcast. a Navy veteran. Thank you for your time and thank you for serving the country. Thank you. Our thank good you, friend, Jim. You. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you. What was your last name again? I'm sorry. I'm horrible um, at Jim, pronouncing names, and I don't um, want to mess it up. <laughs> Jim Crippen. Jim, Jim Crippen. Crippen. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Yeah, that's with a, a P P P P E N. Uh huh. <laughs> Crippen. How are you doing today? Good. So, how was your childhood? And then we'll get going to when you uh, joined the Navy. Uh, I joined the Navy when I was sixteen. But even before I joined the Navy, I was working on a base back in New York. The middle lake of the Finger Lakes is Seneca Lake. And I was working down there where they had a uh, training center along the lake. And I was a hod carrier. Everybody was working for the war effort at that time. I was 16. I'd already been watching these dive bombers from the Germans, the Stukas, and I wanted to get into that. But uh, before I could get in, I figured I better be 16 yeah. <laughs> at least. <laughs> that was the legal age of joining the... No, no, that was not. That I forged my birth certificate. It was pretty easy to see, just inky eradicated. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> just a normal signature. Yeah. <laughs> they, they didn't care in those days. Was, <laughs> who, whoever could walk, you know. Could join. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they would take you. But anyway, it was uh, there that I was working for the Navy. Na it was a Navy uh, training base. And we were putting up a huge smokestack which really was a uh, probably 50 to 100 feet. I don't know how tall it was, but it, it was big. It was as big as this room at the bottom, and they had a doorway going in. And when you went in with the mud for the for the guy that was putting in the fire bricks around the bottom, uh, the the uh, he would be working inside and I would have to go in, in and out of the door. And it was like a hurricane because of the atmospheric difference between the top of the stack and the bottom. The pressure? The pressure, yeah, gradient. That would create all that wind. And that's why they were so good at heating all of the barracks mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the water and all, whatever they had to have which would be, I'm, I digress all the time when I'm talking, because when I went up to one time in the four engine planes, PB4Y1, same as a B-24, only a single vertical stabilizer. Mm -hmm. uh, B-24 had two stabilizers in the back. We had one. But it was the same thing. Had the still had the blisters on the side, four engines, and we were up in Nome, Alaska, as one place we would land and spend the night, 
And then the next day, somebody, one of the four planes, we were in Kodiak, four planes. We were doing a geodetic survey for the, for the uh, government, flying back and forth on flight lines. You can imagine how boring that was. <laughs> At 20,000 feet with oxygen and the jackets that they had for us were f sheepskin lined leather jackets, but they were the worst things we ever had because they would crack. Uh -huh. It wasn't properly cured, apparently. They made them in a hurry, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But at 20,000, they were quite cumbersome. It wouldn't and, last as long yeah. then. And that, there I can digress again. When we were in the North Atlantic on a carrier and you're flying, you know, taking off and landing up there, you had to have a poopy suit on, they called it, a rubber outfit, because in the water, they said people would die in just a few minutes if if you had to crash land, you know, mm -hmm. with your suit and your life jacket, and that sort of thing. But if it was with a plane, of course, you, you might have a flight jacket if it's over water or a, a, a raft that would come out of the plane, just like the commercials. But anyway, uh, you can go from one thing to the other like that if that's all right. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, the four-engine plane up there, we would send one plane up to check the weather and then radio back, I was the radio man, radio back to the ones on the ground to come on up. The weather's clear, we can do our job. But invariably, we would have days when it was not proper, you know, there what, was a lot this of a, weather. Was this post-war or, or This before? was yeah. after the war. Okay. After the war. Yeah. After. But uh, during the war, I was down in getting back to the beginning. In the beginning, I went down to Curacao in uh, just off the coast of Venezuela because they had a lot of oil down there in the submarine, anti-sub. But it was also during uh, one of the interesting things was we got to do some interesting flying there because when Castro was uh, coming to power, they had a lot of gun runners bringing guns from the states down to Castro or you know, to mm -hmm. the op opposition group. Mm -hmm. And they would be working right along the coast where, where the, the beach was. So we had to fly real low. And they said the props would hit the, the top of the waves. <laughs> but you could see under the palm trees, you know, mm -hmm. that way. So we had some interesting flying there. So you got to see a lot of scenery. Yeah, that yeah. was cool. We enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for the gun runners, and yeah. and, uh, and going back to a little bit to yeah. uh, when you were sixteen and we're gonna enlist. What what made you take that decision to to enlist at sixteen years? Patriotism. Everybody was patriotic, and that's why I hate our present ex president. Mm -hmm. One of them that says he knows more than the general. Or the admiral. I mean, you know, they go to school, they spend years and years in doing it. Yeah. I mean, this is what I would call an asshole. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, right. But anyway, we got a, a democracy, so we have to live with people that are full of bull. Uh, sometimes we get a president that way. Do you feel yeah. like people are more split now than back in the day? More divided? Well, as far as democracy goes, everybody was patriotic at that time. We're trying to fight for the nation. The ty type of people that are dictators, mm -hmm. that want to be dictators now. You know, they want to get rid of democracy now, here. And then during the war, in the beginning, of course, everybody is patriotic. Mm -hmm. We we just love our country and freedom 
And it's nothing like now where yeah. half of the people are listening to somebody talking about getting rid of our democracy. And you got a lot of people that are going along with it. They say there's even a chance that we will go that way if he gets enough votes. I mean, this is the worst situation our country has ever had. During the war, it was bad because we had to go over and fight somebody else. But now we're in the middle of our own. We're pretty much, you could say, fighting ourselves in some way. Fighting huh? ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, half of the people in this country are prepared to vote, apparently, for somebody that tells lies all the time. I mean, I have a daughter that I brought up as a Christian, and I asked her one day, of course, if you're a Christian, don't you want somebody in charge of our country that has the same ideas that you have? And this, this situation now is, it's completely upside down. He's, he's got every vice that you can imagine. If, if he hasn't broken the rules, may mention one thing that he, that he has said that makes him patriotic, you know, for our country. A president is supposed to leader, be the leader, mm -hmm. the general. Right. He's in charge of everything. He can do a lot of good or a lot of bad. Mm -hmm. So you don't want a dictator in, in charge of our country. We want a democracy. We want freedom. Yeah. This is a terrible situation. Land of the have. free at the end of the day, right? Yeah. This to me is the main, the main issue for our podcast at this time of the world for mm -hmm. our country. Uh, that's why I bring it up, but I know that's not what you no, want. No, that's no, that's definitely, definitely a good definitely topic. A good as topic. Well. Oh, yeah. Definitely a good really. topic to touch on. Um, when you joined um, the Navy, um, did you have a girlfriend back in the day, or was there any uh, anything holding you back from joining? My childhood sweetheart joined me when I came up from Curacao to the receiving ship Pier 92. She and I, I was on leave at the time. I had 30 days leave. So I went up to upstate New York, Montour Falls, and I made uh, some suggestions about getting married. And uh, she says, well, if we don't get married now, I don't know that we will get married. You know, we may drift apart or whatever. So if we're going to do it, we should do it now instead of whatever happens to you, who knows? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she was in nurse's training, a candy striper, they called it at that time. A lot of young ladies were doing their duty. You know, they knew they'd need a lot of nurses. Nice. So mm -hmm. she was a candy striper. And she and I were sweethearts. We would go swimming around there where we where we lived was wonderful for kids to grow up in an area the town didn't have anything for kids to do at that time it was a poor town very poor part of the appalachian chain appalachian mountains go all the way up through new york up into new england mm -hmm. and that an interesting aspect of that is that these mountains now have eroded down to just a few thousand feet, where they used to be as big as uh, the Himalayas. Wow. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time. And, of course, the Finger Lakes is an interesting consideration. I, I just love, uh, because now I'm into the great courses, thousands of lectures, that I have under my bed <laughs> in these containers, you know. But they say these are the 
10 most important or best professors in the world from Oxford and all, all of our own uh, colleges around uh, or universities. But they, uh, I love to hear the intelligent professors. I mean, it, it's marvelous, <laughs> especially yeah. for somebody that never had any schooling to speak of, you know, mm -hmm. technical stuff. But the Finger Lakes was created during the last ice age or ages. They say it happened quite often. Uh, every 194 million mm -hmm. years, it would happen that we would have an ice age. And of course, it was just the 13,000 years ago that, well, they have found a girl out on one of the islands, the Channel Islands off LA, was one of the first finds of any uh, civilization, you know, out of Africa that got around to, to come down uh, during the ice ages. That was all ice between Russia and America, mm -hmm. North America. But then when that opened up a little bit, then they could come with their canoe or whatever down the coast and they find them. Uh, the uh, girl was uh, supposedly one of the first that ever got to America. That would be in the last 13,000 years and that's when the ice, the last ice age was receding and you had all of this water generated. For example, over in Egypt, they say there was nobody living in the Egyptian valley where the Nile is mm. at that time when, when the ice age was over because there was so much water. water. Mm -hmm. Oh, another thing. The Saharas as well, right? Yeah. Another thing in uh, digressing again, in the upper United States and Canada, the water collected up there in such a large quantity, it was like all of the Great Lakes put together. I forget the name of the area, but somebody finally discovered what caused this canyon down through here to the coast, mm. you know, when it finally broke loose. But things like that, I don't remember from school. They probably, you know, maybe they were teaching things like that, but I don't think so. Yeah, probably. Yeah, pro yeah, probably not. Yeah. They don't touch on those topics. No, huh? I guess they probably haven't even discovered it back in those days. True. This True. was horse and buggy days. If you if you want to get into any of that, how did uh, you communicate with family back in the day? How in the navy, you? yeah. How how would you stay in touch with family or my cell phone? Hello. Okay. <laughs> no cell phone. <laughs> like why yeah. all, no Facebook. Yeah, no. yeah, it's the same way with radar in in the Navy. Getting back to the Navy, but I started out in the, this twin engine bomber down in Curacao. It had a British invention that they were inventing during the beginning of the war. This was in forty three. But the small little uh, scope that I had on my plane that could detect uh, ships and uh, submarines, hopefully, the, the periscope, uh, if the sub was on the surface, then you could detect mm -hmm. them. But the periscope was very minuscule return, you know. So the that's the radar the beginning radar was an apps four the very first one i it was probably the first one they put in planes uh it was a british invention like i say it had a trace down the middle with what they call grass on each side which was noise of course it wasn't a target and then if you had a target over on the right side let's say we had two yagi antennas one under each that was movable, hydraulic. And then if the target was on the right side, you'd have a target on the middle of your trace over on the right side. But then if your plane moved 
into the target, you would have both of them, mm. both under the wings there, the, the antennas would both be picking up the target if you're heading towards it. So your little pl bip, uh, blip on the middle would be on both sides when you're heading towards it. So it was, and before you went in the Navy in, in air crew training, they would have such, such a thing as recognition classes where you could recognize ships, planes, and what have you. And they had training in, in the military is over the top, the British would say, <laughs> Americans anyway. <laughs> because, for example, when, when we first got into the PV-1 Vega Ventura, twin-engine bomber with an upper deck, twin 50s, a uh, uh, turret, twin fifty. We we had to learn how to disassemble and and belt and do everything you have to do with a fifty caliber, and uh, make 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 a belt of ammunition, you know, and mm. put it in in the boxes and put it in the machine and move it. It all started uh, doing that stuff. You start with aerial gunnery with something that uh, lots of people do, and that's skeet shooting, you know, with a shotgun, mm -hmm. the lead and lag, when, oh, yeah. when yeah, they yeah. shoot off the little duck or whatever they call it. The clay or uh, whatever. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, the clay pigeon. Yeah, the clay pigeon, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to lead that thing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll never hit okay. the yeah. bird, you know. So, and then they'll put you in a... Uh, a little track that they make, like a railroad track, only small, miniature, and they'll put you in that, and you're riding down the track. You're going this way, and the target is moving that way. You know? <laughs> so then you got to lead, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. with the with the fifties, you know, or or with you start small, of course, with mm -hmm. smaller machines, uh, caliber. Uh, Just with practice, get better. You get better. With yes. practice, yeah. <laughs> and then you also, for when you go in the plane, you have, with the guns, you have to learn how to use the rads uh, in in the gun sight, you know, the, the rings and how, and then recognize, uh, of course, they teach you German planes, Japanese planes, all kinds of planes, all kinds of ships, and uh, so on. So. so you don't get friendly fire. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Was there? But, oh, sorry. Go ahead. But one of one of the things that they taught us, we the whole crew had to go whenever the instructor was teaching the pilots how to do things, mm -hmm. and we would go up to twenty thousand, or you know, go up pretty high. And he would take us up into a dead stall. I mean, with no engines. Mm. Or he would take us up with full engines. Or with one engine. <laughs> you know, all kinds of weird stuff like that. <laughs> Different you scenarios. Pro and we never ran into that in real life, you know. I never did. You had the adrenaline going up to the max? Well, at least they would learn how to get it windmilling back as you're heading down and picking up a lot of speed. You windmill the prop and, and get it started that way or whatever. It, you you learn some stuff along the way. You, know? <laughs> you, you learn how to, how to withstand all those Gs as well, right? But yeah, and they would also cut the engine on landing. You're coming in. We had two engines, so... You could actually land with one engine if you didn't have a full tank. Now, that brings me back to the B-24. How many times are we going to do this? Just once? No, we, we... Anyway, talking about the engines, I was in B the B-24s up in Alaska, right? Geodetic survey. And I was right behind the two pilots. Mm. And in the old B-24... They had sliders, the pilot and the co-pilot, on the windows that they could open the win <laughs> window, actually. And 
they didn't go as fast, you know, as, mm -hmm. as uh, the modern plane. So we were, they would offload a whole truckload of fuel into our bladder tanks in the B-24 where the bombs used to be in the bomb bay. They had bladder tanks, they called them, where they would load the bladder tanks, fill them up, and fill up the wing tanks. And, of course, that would take the whole truckload of fuel. Well, that meant you, you had to have all of your engines going to take off, a lot of, a lot of weight. And a lot of weight would mean that if one of your engines cut out, uh, like on takeoff this one day, I have a little, in my compartment right behind them, the pilots, I had a little porthole on the port side, left side, and number one and two, I could see out my window, well, at least number two, right next to the window, and three and four. I didn't have any vision over there. I had my equipment, you know, and... Uh, this one day we're taking off and we're, when the plane sets overnight, the plane captain is supposed to move the plane and get the wheels, the, the, the rubber wasn't real great in those days. They, they had cheaper rubber than they do nowadays. And you would get a flat tie uh, on the bottom of these, the, the wheel was as big as I am. Okay, six foot tall, let's say. And all this weight sitting on it, it would it would have a flat spot. And the plane would just, everything, you know, <laughs> just like in the movies, it really wanted to exaggerate. You know? Yeah, it was all over the place. I swear you couldn't couldn't see the edge of the, the wheel when it was wobbling like it, on takeoff. Yeah. If the if the plane captain wasn't doing his thing, moving it ahead of time, so get it get rid of the flat spot. Mm. But anyway, this one day, number two caught fire at the point of no return. Fire starts coming out of the engine. I'm looking at it. I told them you got fire. I don't know whether they saw it or whatever, but anyway, pretty soon. There's a big bundle of cake. Everything is not covered up in a military plane, right? Like in a commercial plane. Mm -hmm. So I've got a big bundle of wires. It must be a hundred in there. And uh, like when a plane has a uh, gets old and has an old age, they ha it has to go into O and R, and they rip out all that stuff, you know, and put all new wiring in. Well. These wires would have to be replaced because they were burning <laughs> yeah, red. You know, it was not fire, flame, no flames, but they were red, charred, you know, and smoke, of course, is filling the whole area and the pilots can't see. <laughs> oh. And the runway is, is aligned towards the north and here's... They called the mountain right there Old Bertha. Was what we called the old mountain. I don't know why, but we, <laughs> we had to make a left turn. <laughs> we had to make a left turn and what they call a racetrack pattern. That's normal for all planes, not even now, I think. Uh, at least for, like, here I digress, you know. When you're making a run, on your target, you always go, well, at least we did, always go in from the left because you can look down and you can see where you're going mm. and where the target is into, and you always had what they call interval. All the planes, like you always usually had a four-plane section, we did, and we would have four sections, 16 planes, or whatever they had uh, available availability was another thing you were supposed to have 80 percent i was a chief in the shop and when we're aboard ship they want 80 percent you know that means more than two planes down is a problem 
Mm. You can't have more than two. <laughs> and if you did, here comes the skipper or <laughs> the maintenance officer or, or somebody will come up to the, you know, the radio shack and say, what are you guys doing? Push you going to have a night shift <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to fix this thing? We got to have that plane fixed, you know, things like that. Sometimes you would get a real, but yeah, it, it was, but anyway, the engine, of course, you can't cut the engine. It's got to keep going because of the weight. Mm -hmm. And we couldn't have landed in the water like uh, Sully did in New York City recently, <laughs> you know, a couple of years ago. But anyway, because there's outcroppings of rock up in Kodiak, right where we had to make our racetrack pattern, if you could have gone in the water, we probably would have. I mean, who wants to take a chance on a with all that fuel we got? You yeah, know, yeah, and yeah. It always reeked of gasoline anyway, or JP4, not gas. But anyway, it was a real problem, and everybody is, and the pilots couldn't see their instruments hardly. I don't know just how bad it was. It looked pretty bad from where I was because they got their heads right near the window mm -hmm. that's, you know, they slid them back to get rid of the smoke. But they still had a cabin full of, uh, of smoke. Uh, smoke. It was, I, I consider it, and they told us later that you guys are lucky dogs because that spar, the main spar that holds the wing on is aluminum, an I-beam, and it was almost burned in two. Dang. You know, it was it was terribly dangerous. It would have snapped. Yeah. They said that was a, 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 a very bad situation. You were lucky dogs. Yeah. And, of course, when we came around, the fire trucks were out there with their foam and everything, and we're down out of the Bombay as soon as we could get out. Was, were there any moments where you you thought you were in danger or where you thought it was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it to see another day. Well, when this happened, I, I'm thinking of where do I get my next milkshake? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, that, that describes everything. Yes. You never had any fear of anything, yeah. huh? <laughs> Actually, I, yeah, you have fear at that time. Yeah, but uh, most of the time, I always had, they say young people are that way. You always have the feeling that you're invincible when you're young. I never worried about being over the ocean, you know, and, uh, mm. and I knew that we very seldom found anybody that disappeared in the ocean. You know, if they had a, a problem, uh, they would send a carrier out for air, air sea rescue sometimes. Didn't find anybody, usually. The only thing you had in those days was on your life vest, you had a marker, you know, a, a die marker, you might call it, that would give a, a shark chaser type thing. But uh, nowadays, they undoubtedly have GPS, you know, that goes off as soon as you hit the water if you're out in the ocean. Hmm. You know, they can probably find people now. And then all, all those airplanes... Uh and jets they have the the black box or what do they call it the one uh mm -hmm. the one that records, records everything, everything right i don't think we had any black box okay maybe that came on a little later oh, after right so, yeah. yeah like just in case there was like a, cat a catastrophe they were able to record the last seconds of what was yeah being said. I, I never thought of that but i don't remember any black box D did you ever get black to red box. red box something like that black box did, did you ever did you ever get to work with that uh with the bomb site and, and the bombers? No. We didn't have any bomb sites. Oh, okay. I don't know how they dropped their bombs. They must have had something. I don't know how they did it. Mm -hmm. Was it was well, the torpedo, of course. Torpedo bombers. The yeah. pilot, you know, he just lines up the plane and drops it under underneath in the same direction. And 
I saw something on a movie one time. Oh, it was uh, about jamming the uh, the frequency. And there was, oh, it was a movie about this movie actress, a famous old, uh, old-time old movie actress, Hedy Lamar. What? Might have been a Hedy Lamar, but anyway, she had said, well, if they're jamming your torpedoes and they're, they're not able to follow, she, she came up with a stepping device that they rejected completely when she brought it to the military. They rejected it and said, oh, no, that's too, too far-fetched or something. But anyway, she invented something that they use now for almost everything. They said it's in GPS now, and it's uh, it it gives you the uh, ability to have stepping frequencies mm. by having a wheel that's moving in sync with the frequencies that you want. Anyway, White. she invented it, and she should have. Uh, you know, it was an invention, so they should have given her credit. Yeah, yeah. And things like, they never did. Nobody ever gave her credit. Oh, they did have something. Yeah, she was she was ill a few years from dying. They did have a, uh, a ceremony for her in Hollywood, I think it was, and gave her credit for it. Mm -hmm. But... No money and no nothing. And nothing. no uh, patent or anything yeah. like that. You know, a lot of inventions that we have today uh, came from the military, right? Like the microwave. I believe it was invented in the military. Yeah, like by accident. Oh, well, they say yeah. Yeah, that's what they say. They say we're, <laughs> a lot of our inventions came because of the yeah. military. Yeah. Making the atomic bomb, yes. for example. I, you know. I, I think uh, post war. <clears throat> Is when a uh, it was a a different age started in, in America, you know. Another era. Yeah, you could you could say that in American history, it's pre-war and then post-war. You can divide, you know, the technology before and after. I was actually one of the guys that was saved by the atomic bomb. When I was leaving Pier ninety two, on this troop train going across, I was. I was already assigned to Cashew 6 in Alameda, Carrier Aircraft Service Unit 6, and I was getting what I put in for originally after air crew training, and that was dive bombers, SBDs, mm -hmm. not TBMs, torpedo bomb. I was, I was infatuated, <laughs> excited, I guess you'd say, during the war, or in the beginning, before I got in, with the Stukas, the dive bombers the Germans had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they didn't even, they weren't able to even fold their wheels up, you know. They were very awkward looking <laughs> <Yeah>. ducks, you know, <laughs> coming down with their flaps, you know, the dive flaps out. But I, I thought it was cool when I was a kid watching the newsreels of what was going on in Germany or in Europe with the dive bombers and things. So I put in for dive bomber instead of anything else. Uh, and I got a twin engine bomber down in, you know, in the Caribbean, saved my life probably by not getting the dive bomber because the dive bombers really took a beating mm -hmm. over in, especially uh, near the end of the war when they had the big uh, shootouts. But anyway, they needed to have replacements at that time near the end of the war. And I was on my way over there and I had been assigned to, as a replacement for the SBD. And I got to ride in one up in uh, Alameda. We took off one day, I was with an ensign and he says, 
And this was uh, another time when I was lucky dog because he, he's, he says, are you buckled in? We're going to do a dive <laughs> over the bay up there. And I said, yeah, I'm, and luckily I was. I, I died, <laughs> yeah. You're sitting on your chute, you know, mm. and your harness and all that stuff. And my canopy was open. I, I suppose his was too. He, we, it was just a joy ride, you might say. Training, <laughs> training ride. Training ride. Look, looking at the, yeah. at the scenery. <laughs> so I was, I was, at least I was, I had been in at that time before the end of the war. I had been in torpedo bomb. I, I was in torpedo bombers as uh, we were hunter killer, they called it for submarines again. And we had all kinds of equipment up where the turret used to be. <clears throat> I think I lost my, my original train. Oh, the dive bomber. Oh, so when I was in those, we always went in like, like if we're going in, we had a Joe English up, and this is well after the war. It might have been up near the Korean War. We we were over there in the Korean War too. But the the dive bombers were always practicing, you know. Or I mean, our our torpedo bombers would do the same thing practically as the dive bomber, except we would roll in from the side. Joe English was a place where we used to drop bombs and strafe and stuff like that. But anyway. Uh, let's see. Um, he says, okay, if you're strapped in, then we're going to do it. Okay, here we're, you're ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. And luckily I was because he went over the top, which I'd never done before. <laughs> <laughs> and my canopy was open. If I hadn't been strapped in, I'd have been. Out the, he he jacked out the window. straight out because <laughs> he went just over the. <laughs> were you always strapped, or, or there was times where you were you weren't strapped? You're always strapped in, okay. Supposedly, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's like in the in the passenger plane, you know. <laughs> Sometimes you're loose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, how how was it uh, working with everybody? Like everybody around you, did you get along with everybody? Was it, uh, I don't know, a hostile environment? The only hostile environment that was really hostile where I had to conf had confrontation, confrontational uh, talk, <laughs> shop chief, I guess you'd say, never had any problems before. When the jets came in, the F-14s, we were up to the point where we had a little sophistication in the shop too because they were bringing in what they called vast equipment with a computer and you had to have a harness, uh, you had to have a program for each individual unit, black box, that you had in the plane. Mm -hmm. Every black box had a different function, of course. We had a lot of black boxes, and that was when you had, uh, instead of all everything being individually wired up inside the black box, we started having uh, boards, uh, motherboards that we would put in and on the top of the motherboards, you had test points. And with an oscilloscope, you can go in and get waveforms on almost all of it. If it's a, just a DC or if it's just a power line, there's nothing. But anything else usually has a design that you can look at and tell whether it's right or wrong. And then... But anyway, towards the end of the war, they said, we're going to bring in computerization of all of your spare parts that you have in your drawers. 
to fix these things. And we knew a lot of times, like for radar, you, you had everything in oil and there was a, uh, uh, but anyway, getting back to the test equipment, they, they came in with computers where you had umbilical plugs and in the beginning, they were a big problem because you'd have 64 connectors that had to make, in other words, for your program to work for that particular black box, okay. mm. right? Well, if any one of the, so that happened pretty regular in the beginning. I, I'm sure they got it uh, wrapped up. And uh, anyway, that, that was, uh, one of the things that they did, and, and all of the, the stuff we had in our drawers to fix things and the things that we knew that were repetitious, we would have quite a few of those, let's let's say. Well, they didn't want that. That's, that's too much waste. They wanted to have everything computerized, and if you wanted something, they had a major storage area on the ship or they would have some place they could get it in a hurry <clears throat> if you needed something. Mm -hmm. So it took us a while to, you know, to catch up with that. We still kept a few things that, we, you know, it it was gradual, mm -hmm. and eventually it turned out to be wonderful because you had everything tested as a black box. And then they got it down to the night shift, could take another program and test each individual card, you know, specifically. Well, like first you, you just locate which board is, is causing a problem. And then you have to put it, take it out and put a new board in. And then the night shift would look at the board and, and fix it. Uh, so it it all worked out. That's fine. when the technology was st starting to come about. Yeah, right there, in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, what, what what do you know about Antarctica? Antarctica, just what I read, you know, and what the the TV tells us. Yeah. I know they have people down there all the time now. Because I know there's a treaty where no one can go uh, over there or something like that between nations. Mm. They, they have a, a base, and there's all the countries that want to be there can be there. They've got an agreement, of course. It's like a neutral zone? That nobody owns it or, you, yeah. you know, they just own out around it. But uh, on, on the ice, they do have something all the time, you know, places where people have to come and just like the space station. Mm -hmm. Uh, something like that, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, you know, I've seen, I've seen that on TV, mm -hmm. and people go down there. You know, the news people sometimes take a ride down there, mm -hmm. and they check out the sh the ship and the surrounding areas. The ocean, of course, is very much watched nowadays. Mm -hmm. It's it's getting pretty dirty. Oh, okay, okay. Polluted. And do do you do you miss being in the navy? I always thought it would be very nice if they had a program where, and I think there there was or is, oh, they had something for, you could take your kid out there on a weekend cruise or uh, over to maybe even to Hawaii, I think they had. You could take your kid or, you know, son, a, a recruiting type thing. Mm. Yeah, I think, but you could go aboard ship, yeah, I'll just, you know, they had open house days and things like that for some areas restricted but you know. if, if you can go back in time to right before you're gonna enlist would you enlist again at my age yeah if you could go back in time oh at, back you, in time yeah if you would, could, oh, would yeah. you do it again yeah. would you do it again do do my life again sure it was cool i i was lucky dog Many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> I thought. You, you know, like nowadays they talk about aliens and stuff. Did you see any aliens back in the day or? No. No. 
Or is there something where, like, no one can talk about that stuff? Well, you've got all kinds of people in the Navy, just like I had a friend that was always saying weird things that I had to, once in a great while, I would say, well, you you can't do that, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I said, we've, we've got stuff to... If if you did that, then we they talked about countermeasures, you know. I mean, like we can't drop an atomic bomb. Nobody can, supposedly. And only the terrorists would ever do that. You've got restrictions on everything you do. Mm-hmm. And we can't use anything over in what the British would say over the top. You can go like they're doing now over in uh, Ukraine. We can't give them certain types of equipment that we have. That's, and I'm sure the Russians, if they wanted to, I don't understand that, why the Russians can't bring their big bombers over there and just annihilate everybody, or, you know, all of mm-hmm. the buildings. Like in, in the city, the, mm-hmm. the, the capital, Kiev. You know, Kiev used to be a uh, slave trading center. And the two rivers that come out of or down right in that area, there's two of them. One of them has too many falls. In the old days, they used to have to take the boats out of above the falls and bring them down. They had to. But anyway, coming down into the Black Sea, Caspian, Caspian, anyway, down into Islam. Hmm. Islam was a great place for tra- getting slaves down there. They were buying slaves a lot. The whole one thing that has amazed me is the idea of slavery. And we got rid of slavery just recently after the British had already gotten rid of it, supposedly. And after the world has now, but we still have, you know, sex slaves and all kinds. Mm -hmm. And some of the people that are working are more or less the same basic idea as yeah, what they used to have. But it was it was a uh, like the Roman Empire. It was just part of life. Everybody had slaves. Even slaves owned slaves after they had been freed. You could buy your way out, just like the, even the gladiators could buy their way out if somebody had a, enough money and would buy them. Or, uh, I, but... When you're in school and, and uh, they talk about slavery, the only thing you ever hear in our schools is the Civil War, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. and the slaves down there. But the whole world in the beginning had slaves. always had slaves. Mm-hmm. And it was always dog eat dog. You know, was status they and- talk about in Africa. They were always killing each other, you know, from place to place. In Italy, every city and town you know, they had, I was surprised not too long ago, I was redoing one of my uh, DVDs, I think, and uh, I said, huh, I didn't, I didn't know that I had, oh, it was a uh, DVD I have on the uh, visions, they call it, flying over, hmm. and this was flying over France, and the, the Lior Valley, I've been there. I've been all over Europe. I love your travel, Italy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all over the world, actually. Uh, you know, a lot of it. I, I still haven't gotten enough. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I still bug my daughter every, every <laughs> once in a while. Where are we going next? <laughs> What's the place you love the most out of all of them that you have got to? I like Europe best. Like, if you go on a cruise from... L.A., you can go over to Mexico, or you can take a long cruise to Hawaii, or you can go all the way to Europe, or you can go around the world. I've just Mm -hmm. read something recently. They have a lot of world cruises now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
but uh, getting back to the slave thing, they they had everybody had slaves, and um, I didn't, I wasn't aware of that when I was growing up. Just until fairly recently, I guess you'd say. Of course, my DVDs and reading the books and all that. No, is there any? I'm, mess- I'm not into reading books. I will read just about everything in National Geographic and uh, readers. Nah, not nah, not even readers digest. But uh, some some of the smaller things, like like I get. Uh, what is it I get? AARP? Yeah, I, I get the, and I look at which ones, which articles. Mm-hmm. I read articles, you know, but, and I have read a few books, and I do book reviews like the G, great courses that have the great books from Russia or the great books from here, there, or the other. So, or the great authors and things like mm-hmm. that, you know. I do, I do think just about every genre okay I have under my bed <laughs> <laughs> Is there any lesson that you would like to leave for the upcoming generation The two things that I think are most important is your diet yourself know yourself Mind control is probably more important than anything else in the world because you take one aspect of mind control and say perception. There's a few words that are that are very important. Expectations and and along with perception is you. You have a, a lot of words, like in German, I love Schmetterling, <laughs> the butterfly. Butterfly. <laughs> yeah. Or Straßenbahn Haltesteller. The Straßenbahn is the streetcar. And the Halton Steller is a place where it stops, Halton. And the Stellar is the little cover over, I guess. Like a garage. Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a few things like that. But, but yeah, mind control. If see if if you, it's so simple. I find myself doing it quite often now. You can sit like I could sit there in my one room or my one bedroom. I used to have a house. I've got to readjust my whole life. And it's the mind. I cannot, if I sit there and I let myself go in the wrong direction, I will say, hmm, I don't know. I, I did, I, and when I would go on a trip, you know, over in Europe, I would take, I would say, I go to the, uh, Rise Bureau, where they have the trips that you can take, you know, with the buses. Mm-hmm. And I would say, okay, now for this period that we're going to be here, I'm going to analyze how many trips that we could take because there's hundreds of trips and only during certain periods of time that they do it, you know, the bus. And I love to travel with the, uh, with the bus trip where they arrange your hotel, your meals, everything. So I thought it was cool. And I would do that when we go to Germany or Munich because right in the middle of Europe, I mean, I, I, that's why I've been all over to all of the main cities, all of the main countries, I guess you'd say. And I've got these vision videos I love flying over. I guess that's because I'm always uh, to Airedale mm. at heart. I love to go on, on a plane. <laughs> yeah. Well, we want to thank you for joining us today yeah. and, and for your your valuable words and yes. life lessons that you left yes. us. Yeah. And hopefully in the future we can record an, another episode. Another there, part there's, still, there's still more we could talk about and cover. Oh, and yeah. we could talk about your art because we know you like to do art as well, you know. 
Thank yeah. you for joining us. Yeah, and I used I used to weed onions. I used to do all when I was a kid. I was always, uh, what's important? Important in life is making some money. You got to have the basics, enough money to cover the basics: food, shelter, medical, all of these things. You have to have a trade or do something that you love, especially. Mm -hmm. If you're doing what you love, or or it won't be work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, true. Very you won't true. see or it as it work. It makes work a lot yeah. easier. Yeah. Yeah. Work yeah, is work. You still got to do. When, when you, know, so you like it, huh? When so you, you like never it. saw being in the Navy like work? Well, yeah. And, and I would have some reservations uh, leaving home and that sort of thing, you know, you leave the kids yeah. and my wife has to take care of the kids by herself and all that stuff, the house and everything. That A woman has a lot going for them all the time. As a wife of a, yeah. a military. And I'm finding that out more and more now since I have to do everything because I don't want to spend $8,000 a month in a place that provides everything, mm. you know. I mean, who can afford to do that? Do you know you gotta yeah, be rich? Yeah. I wish there yeah. was more help for the veterans too in, in that aspect, you know. There's one big thing I'd like to say about that. Say this about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had thirty six years in the Navy or working for the Navy, let's say. And I don't qualify for hardly anything, except I do have my retirement. But when it comes to medical or the VA, I went down the other day and I've got a couple of teeth here that I've been neglecting. One of them is I can feel it there, root canal. And so I said, oh, Instead of spending a couple of thousand on the root canal, like they want in civilian life, I'll go down to the VA. It's just down the road, mm. five minutes. I'll go down there since I live here and I got nothing better to do. <laughs> <laughs> so I went down and he said, oh, no, we don't, we don't do that. We don't do dental. So, well, the girl said that, the receptionist. Oh, no, they don't cover dental. So... Then when I think back to where I am or where I was, the uh, care facility, mm -hmm. they have, the VA has thirty five up to $3,500 to help you when you get elderly and retired. That only covers, if you're making too much money, like a chief in the Navy, if you work your way up for 20 years and then another 16 in the Cal Lab, you're making too much money, retirement money. You don't qualify for anything. Because <laughs> Brianna, my granddaughter, she called first when we went into that facility. She called the VA. I hadn't called anybody, but uh, she called. And they told her, well, they do have 3500 but I don't think you'll qualify because your income is too high. And that there's something about that. There's something it's the same there. way in California when, when it comes to my wife says, "Well, I'm going to take half of your if we get divorced, I'm going to take half of your military too." I said, what do you mean you you weren't with me in the middle <laughs> yeah. at all? Yeah. 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 So yeah. the harder you worked, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. They gotta so a, they gotta re they gotta organize re those structures arrange those, right now. Those structures. Social welfare. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. A nowadays, welfare state. No, right? yeah. especially yeah. in the state of California. Yeah, right? they want to have the family separate yeah. with that social money. But yet I had a blind daughter. She got she got wiped out in the uh, 19, COVID-19 virus thing. 
she she got that because she was heavy and her lungs weren't any much she, she was not really a healthy person she, and in the end she was so hel ha healthy uh she had diabetes she couldn't walk hmm. and she, being blind is a very big handicap because she doesn't do the exercise that we can do, you know, walking and, and everything. I still do. At, I'm 97. I do my weights, and, you know, up with my, for leg. I wanted the second floor where we are partly because of the view and partly because I wanted to go up and downstairs, make my legs work. Because where I lived, I was on the flat. I never had any stairs, except when I went to the doctor and I went up the stairs at the medical facility, the back. Anyway, are we all done? Well, thank you for joining us today. Thank and you for giving no, us thank you. your time. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully a part two, because there's a lot to talk about, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. Thank you. A part two. <laughs>